Oil is our primary energy source. As we've seen, global oil production is probably peaking right about now. Coal is the world's second foremost energy source, likely to peak in 10 to 15 years. Natural gas, number three, global peak could occur in as little as five years, as many as 20 years. Regional peaks are occurring right now. So add this up and we get something like 85% of current world energy will, sources will all begin to decline within the next 25 years. Meanwhile, global population continues to increase. So what we're seeing is a likely dramatic decrease in available energy. Meanwhile, global demand for energy is projected by all responsible agencies to dramatically increase in the years ahead. Energy is the essence of, well, it's the essence of life itself, but it's the essence also of economic activity. Without energy, nothing happens. Without energy, manufacturing can't happen. Without energy, transportation can't happen. So what are we gonna do about all of this? Well, I can tell you a few things that we're, we can't do and ultimately won't do. And that, those, are, those things are replacing current energy sources with things like large-scale ethanol, nuclear power, hydrogen, and clean coal. Uh, ethanol uh, may be a good idea on a very small scale. If one is a farmer and can uh, grow some fuel crops and, and transform them into biofuels right there on the farm and use them on the farm to run some farm machinery, it may not be a bad idea. Running 200 million American automobiles and trucks on ethanol and biodiesel, it's not going to happen. Uh, this quote here underscores the, uh, the inherent limits of land, water, and so on. But there's also the problem of the energy profit ratio of biofuels. Now this is a matter of some dispute. There are some scientists who say the energy profit ratio for most biofuels is actually negative. It takes more energy to make the ethanol and, and so on than you get from actually burning the ethanol. But that's disputed by the Department of, of uh, Agriculture and, and others who say, oh no, there's a 1.3 to 1 or maybe even a 1.8 to 1 energy profit. Uh, how, can we, how can I get across to you how trivial and insignificant uh, an energy profit that is from oil and natural gas and coal. We've been accustomed over the past decades to energy profit ratios on the order of 20, 50, 100 to 1. Hunter gatherers were able to operate on a 10 to 1 energy profit ratio. So we would do better hunting and gathering than producing biofuels in terms of being able to operate an industrial society. If we take away these, these current darlings of the, the energy industry, hydrogen, biofuels, uh, carbon sequestration, uh, uh, nuclear, what's left? Well, the conventional uh, renewable energy sources like solar and wind, there are a few others like tidal power, wave power, geothermal, uh, actually a fairly long list, maybe a, a dozen or, or 20 of them and dramatic conservation efforts. Now those who've looked at all of these renewable options and remember, we're getting 85% of our current energy from fossil fuels and another 6% or so from nuclear. Renewable energy is making up a, a pretty small fraction of what we're using right now. If we look just at solar and wind, for example, it doesn't even show up on most charts because it's a tiny fraction of 1% of the energy we're currently getting. So by, by most estimates, really, the, realistically, we're going to have to work primarily with conservation. Substitution, yes. And with, as we look at substitution of uh, other sources for fossil fuels, we're going to have to become energy literate. That is, we're going, to, we're going to have to understand how to evaluate energy sources so that we don't make enormous mistakes investing 
billions of dollars in, for example, corn-based ethanol or nuclear power or hydrogen research or, or whatever. How are we going to make those decisions more intelligently? Well, we have to learn about energy profit ratios. We have to learn how to assess uh, the infrastructure requirements, convenience of use, environmental impacts, renewability, scalability, location of resource, all of these things have to be taken into account. Currently, that's not being done to a, sig a significant or adequate degree. Uh, politics is to a very large extent driving our energy choices much more than uh, rational analysis. Again, taking all of this into account, it's most likely that there's no credible scenario in which alternative energy sources can make up for declining rates of extraction of fossil fuels. So what, is, what does that mean? Well, <clears throat> here, is, here are some words of wisdom from uh, Thomas Friedman from this last Sunday's edition of New York Times Magazine, an article called The Power of Green. He said, green is not about cutting back. It's about creating a new cornucopia of abundance for the next generation by inventing a whole new industry. It's a message that sells and sells very easily. Uh, our, our governor, Arnold Schwarzenegger, is saying essentially the same thing. Don't talk about conservation and cutting back. Going green can make us all rich. It can be the source of economic growth, whole new industries. Well, yes we will see new industries emerge as a result of this energy transition. But the fact is, we are going to have to cut back. And that, in fact, is the essence of green. And the sooner we understand that and internalize that message and accept it at all levels of society, the better off we'll be because the sooner we'll actually be able to, getting, uh, be to get down to doing something. I have to say that the, the mainstream uh, discourse on climate change is to a large extent poorly informed on energy issues. Why? Well, just one example. Uh, <clears throat> the focus exclusively on using carbon emissions as our only metric of what it means to be environmentally responsible. Now, it's, it's understandable why we would use carbon, carbon emissions, and in most cases, that's, uh, that is perfectly reasonable and acceptable. It's a measure of, uh, well, it, we, we use that, that metric because carbon emissions come from burning fossil fuels, which are problematic in all sorts of ways, as we've seen. Carbon emissions are the primary driver of climate change, and climate change is the worst environmental problem facing us. So what's wrong with just talking about carbon emissions? Well. It can lead to uh, some misunderstandings about our energy situation because the, the whole discussion of carbon emissions ignores fuel supply problems, doesn't take it into account whatsoever. And it tends to lead to these false solutions that we've been discussing. Well, they, they're solutions to, to the problem of carbon emissions, so what's the problem uh, if we can if we can bury the, uh, the carbon from coal or uh, develop more nuclear power. Each of these, these so-called solutions has to be looked at from an energy standpoint and from an environmental standpoint in, in its own right. So my contention is that contrary to uh, Tom Friedman and Arnold Schwarzenegger, cutting back should be the core of our response to the problem facing us. Conservation is going to be inevitably our most effective means of dealing with the energy transition. Uh, like, ener like alternative energy sources, conservation requires investment. It requires change in the way we do things. And investments in efficiency tend to yield diminishing returns. That the first 10% of benefit in energy efficiency is pretty cheap. The next 10% is more expensive and so on. At least in the initial stages, efficiency is almost always cheaper than new supply options. But here's the kicker, curtailment of energy use. Just not using energy is the cheapest option of all. It's the fastest to deploy. 
what makes us not want to think about it or talk about it is that it requires changes in habits and expectations. It requires behavior change. And that's why Tom Friedman and Arnold Schwarzenegger don't want to talk about it.